All right, so here we are, and I think things are back in shape. Oh, I'm first. Yeah, I didn't find any serious stuff today, so all I've got is nonsense. Um, this I thought was pretty great. So Donald Trump's new press secretary uh, just wanted to talk about him donating his quarterly salary to some kind of charity, and so she just held up his bank statement to be recorded with all his information and everything, which is pretty No awesome. way. It's zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Yeah. I know. That, that was, that was the, first <laughs> the first picture I saw was a, 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 an extreme close-up um, with all of his uh, bank account number, his bank account number and routing info uh, <laughs> very clearly displayed. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Well, it'll be pretty, it's kind of like all those ones where like a government agency has their password on a post-it on the monitor while they're on TV and stuff. And the yeah. thing, and then and of course they said, you know, all you people do is write articles about us leaking out the bank account. You aren't like saying what a great guy he is for donating his salary to charity, which is what you should be focusing on, which they might be right about, except I know all the other articles about how he says he was going to donate and then he never really donates. <laughs> So I don't yeah, know. and it's funny how some of the people who actually do the most uh, good deeds don't have a press conference about it and a uh, uh, Tammy Faye Baker clone hold, holding up the check. Yep. Now, she is not a Tammy Faye Baker clone. I knew about Tammy Faye Baker, and Tammy Faye Baker was a lot more like Donald Trump. She had, like, a really special kind of look. There were articles in makeup magazines about Tammy Faye Baker. She... She, I remember the one they said was blending, don't. And then on they go, it was just, she was pretty extraordinarily strange looking creature. Like, like a high school vampire. Anyway. No, no comment. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so I wonder if that number is still good. We should try sending like one cent into that account to see if it actually goes through. I wouldn't recommend that. Bad, Caitlin. It's, bad. To, add, to add a cent to Donald it, Trump's account? I mean, this no. it'll be. I don't, think the, I don't think they'll let you connect from prison to join our, you know, this is like students yes. who learn Wi-Fi hacking. They said, hey, let's go to the airport and practice hacking the Wi-Fi. And I'm like, oh, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, but I'm, it's not like I'm giving the president a step <laughs> that he wants to yeah, do. Like, yeah. Tell it to the judge, sister. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, so telcos are getting hacked, apparently. Yeah, nothing new there. It's just that uh, it's becoming more of an issue now, and I think that's pretty interesting. Um, and I think that this is going to continue to grow. Uh, in fact, it grew, um, according to the fi these findings from CrowdStrike anyway, uh, it grew a lot over the past few years. So, um, you know, I've worked at a telco before. I can assure you the security was non-existent. Um, and, and it's apparently that place wasn't alone. Um, it's, uh, that's, that's an issue at all the, um, all the big guys, um, a, bu a bunch of them are using like software to find networking now that they is awesome technology, but they don't really understand it or how to secure it. Um, you know, it's, it's just a huge mess out there. And, you know, in this country, I don't know, it, it, it varies in other countries, but in this country, there's still no real consequences uh, for companies that fail to um, do their due diligence as far as security goes. So, um, you know, yeah. it, it, in a way, it kind of makes good business sense because security is just a more overhead for them. So, yes. um, you know, why bother to, why bother to protect anything? Um, and, not, and not that, only, yeah, not only that, but there's no evidence that spending on security actually stops you from getting hacked. So it's arguably good business to just ignore it. Yes and no. I mean, I, I think that, that I'm hoping that that changes uh, because, um, you know, these, these may get more and more expensive. I'm hoping that people will become more conscious of this and say, you know, like maybe I'll go, maybe I'll try to go with a a uh, company that respects my security and privacy more. Um, I, I always thought that uh, some of the NV MVNOs are, <coughs> excuse me, some of the MVNOs are good. Um, like Calyx, for example, which What's is very MVNO? nice. Um, so it's, MVNOs are, um, are uh, typically, typically nonprofits, but not always that, um, essentially buy uh, bandwidth and airtime from larger 
from the big like telecommunications conglomerate. So for example, sure. you could have um, Sam's phone company where you sell uh, cell phones and Wi-Fi hotspots um, to your consumers, but essentially those are running on T-Mobile or Sprint or AT&T or whatever um, towers. Uh, the the tele, the tele, the FCC and the telecoms years back um, came to an agreement where they would set aside a certain portion of their resources um, for um, either low income or uh, these MVNOs that sell at full price to private consumers that maybe um, for whatever reason they don't want to uh, use they don't want to use the um, have an account at the telcos hmm. um, and also a lot of nonprofits are you hmm. are using that what does MVNO stand for uh, oh I knew you were gonna ask me that um, it's like mo mobile um, oh it's a uh, mobile virtual network operator okay so um, uh, one of the advantages to that especially if you're using something like Calyx or whatever is all your billing goes through them so uh, all your data is um, all your data is a bit more private because you're not connected to an actual um, defined account that's going through the networks. No, it makes sense really because everybody hates the uh, billing and the performance and complaint system of the big telcos. So having a middle person that gives you like someone you can talk to who will then have more clout when arguing with AT and T or whoever would make right. sense really. Right. Um, the California Community Colleges, like hotspots, are that that they are considered to be an MVNO, I believe. Yeah, so it's like a value-added reseller. Mm -hmm. Well, it makes sense. Okay, and I mean, I'm not surprised that their security is real bad because they have a huge legacy of old infrastructure, and their number one issue is to keep it all running. So just like SS7, I mean, they have to keep using this old broken junk basically forever. Um, yes and no. A lot of it is just stupid stuff. Like they don't uh, protect against SQL injections on their websites and stuff like that. So then it's easy to get dumps of all your customer PII and stuff like that. Um, is, is compliance helping? Because I mean, any reasonable compliance standard would at least make you have to stop doing that. Correct. The problem is, is that it's not really enforceable. Um, even in California, I'm not seeing, you know, this may change. I've, I've, I've read that the, the rules are supposed to get more stringent, but the thing is, there's nobody really enforcing them as it is. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, a, that's sort of the, the, the problem inherent there, too, is that um, not only do you have to determine and prove that there's been a violation since there's no auditing, um, then who's going who's gonna to actually uh enforce it there's no consequences well i know pci actually does make you have like an audit every year and uh there is yeah. some point at which you actually fail enough times that they do something although it's like sure. five years out <laughs> sure but isn't it interesting that it's only concerning the financial aspects? well well you could argue that's the most important thing I don't know. anyway well anyway it's very interesting i'm glad to to get more of visibility into it. It kind of reminds me of the military tests where they keep saying, we tested our network and they're 95% out of compliance. Have a nice day. So <laughs> now we know. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, so then this one here sort of baffled me at first, the separation between Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Why aren't those completely separated? <laughs> because it makes cheaper sense to put them on the same chip. That's... So have the same a chip do combo, both. A combo chip. Yeah, a combo chip. I just wonder why, why is that something you'd want to do? But anyway, then of course it leaks like Spectre and Meltdown, right? Because right. the data on the chip leaks to the other data. Yeah, exactly. You get it from one end, then you have access to the other. Sounds like good, clean fun. Yeah, it's supposed to be, it was going to be in a Black Hat talk, I think. Yeah, and yeah. I guess it will be. Black Hat is supposedly still happening. It'll just be virtual. Yeah. So I don't know how they're going to like hang swag on your doorknob. They'll probably like send you a bunch of IMs or something. Maybe hack in your Bluetooth and inject like <laughs> advertising messages. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. And then, uh, yeah, this one here is awesome. And I just tried it and it worked. So let's talk about this one. 
Notary yeah, let's them. talk about this. So yeah. <laughs> Apple is sending unsigned binaries back to their own servers, all of them, all the binaries. And actually, you know what? I, I misspoke. All executables, not binaries, all execu right. unsigned executables. That yeah. means if you write a script yeah. and you run it, that script gets sent to Apple and they can read the, your entire script. Yeah, let me do it. This is bloody yes. awesome. I tried it yes. right before yeah, we no. started here. And so let me do the restart here. Um, all right, and, and the worst part about all this is that it slows down your system a ton. Oh, I'm sure it does. And so I put, I'm going to put this in test two because I did test one earlier. So what? this this creates a script. Uh, what's going on here? Let me make this bigger. Hong Kong. You're doing a live demo, Sam, so everything has to fail. Oh, well, well, eh, they only fail like two thirds at a time or something. Anyway, so, um, all right. So now, what's, let me get this it nonsense. This, okay, there we are. To Apple? Whatever. Yeah. So I write a script. Wait, not uh -huh. that one. There, here. I, this creates a script that just says hello. And uh, why, what's going on? There we are. Now I'm finally catching on. Test two. Okay, so I've cre it creates a file called test two. Okay, and now I run that file called test two. And here, it's gonna time how long it takes. And so, two awesome things happened. The first thing that happened is the first run took 115 milliseconds, and the second run only took four milliseconds. And the reason that happened is because it sent it to Apple. And you can see it here, it went to api.cloudkit.com. Here it is going to Apple encrypted for what it's worth with TLS version 1.2. And that took that amount of time from 469 to 480. That took 11 milliseconds. And that's uh, part of why this was so slow the first time. The rest is probably the handshake. So it's bloody awesome. Yep. You can totally see it sending this stuff up to Apple. And as I've known for a long time, which is kind of good, clean fun, um, HTTPS does not protect your privacy. It sends the domain name in plain text in the certificate. So um, it has to. <laughs> and so yeah. you can see it sending stuff to that location and getting a reply from that location, even though this is HTTPS. Somewhere down here is the actual script I wrote, encrypted. But the fact that I was talking to Apple is not a secret. And anyway, so it sends all your scripts up to Apple. So that's pretty awesome. And it's easy to see. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how important this is, but it absolutely happens and you can see it. Well, I mean, the, 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 two, the two things, of course, is the slowness and the, and the privacy implications. Yeah, that's huge. What if you're working on some like secret proprietary important software? Like they don't, you know, and then Apple's got it on their servers. That's messed up. Well, yeah, like for example, what if you work for the government? Yeah. Right, right. I'm just I'm just pretending here. I'm just pretending. Oh, yeah, obviously, yeah. I don't work for the government in any in any capacity. But let's say you do work for the government and you're working on sensitive but you know unclassified scripts or something, and you just run it on your laptop and you're testing it out. Well, that is now going to Apple. And that's not good. Well, actually, you know, you have a point. I'm thinking about the uh, the leak from Shadow Brokers of the NSA secrets. They said we put Kaspersky antivirus on it, and it took all our stuff and sent it to Russia. What rotten bums are they? Yeah. <laughs> she well. Uh, yeah. Right. This is this is big. I think. Well, you're you're convincing me to care more. Yeah, you've got a point there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a that's a good one. All right. And so then I've got this one. I thought was pretty good fun. So like forty four percent of Republicans believe that Bill Gates is going to put microchips in your body with his coronavirus vaccine because they listened to Fox News and they said, however, Fox News never directly said that. But if you do listen to Fox News, you probably listen to more alt-right stuff, which amplifies it. And uh, the president's certainly pushing a lot of this stuff, although not this exact one. But anyway, so it is real tempting for people on the left to say, this is those ignorant right-wingers that just believe crap because they're stupid and they want to believe something exciting. So to be fair, here's the left version of the same thing. Pot will protect you from coronavirus. I bet it will, just as much as chloroxyquinone. But anyway. Um, <laughs> these, the, I heard a, a, a person analyzing our society, and he said, "These guys, um, Fox News is pornographers." And I realized that's pretty much what it is. Instead of listening to the boring old news when I was a kid, which I wouldn't listen, it was just boring. Like a politician said this, and they passed a law about something. Now it's exciting, and you're involved, and you're part of the fight. It's like this 
fantasy world where you're like important and significant to listen to like Fox News, or for that matter, the, what's now called the mainstream news, which is pretty much on the left of the same thing. Anyway. Well, what are we going to do when they start putting microchips in the weed? Well, you know, that's something the hippies have believed forever. <laughs> the man is spying on you. You got to like kill your phone and stuff. Well, I mean, that's kind of true. <laughs> it was, that's not, that's not entirely fake. Sam. Not wrong. Well, that's, not the point. well, that's the problem. Why these things survive? There's some truth in all of them. This is like all the adventure movies where there's this myth. And they say, well, there's some truth in that myth. Well, there, it wouldn't sell if there wasn't some truth in it. And I think the basic bottom line of all this is we don't trust authority figures. We don't really trust scientists or educators. We feel like they're all kind of in a plot to mess with us. And there's some truth to that. I heard an analysis of the Harry Potter books and they said, you know, Harry Potter's this poor neglected kid abused, stuck under the, the, uh, the stairwell. And then he finds that he's important and has magical powers. And they said, this is what mo how most kids feel. I'm just getting kicked around like dirt and I really deserve more respect. And I, that was news to me. I didn't think that many people felt that way, but the popularity of the book shows that that's a very common experience. Anyway, so that's, that's what I found. And women, not enough women in cybersecurity. Boy, I felt like this for a long time. We need sure. more women. That's not news. And uh, we know we already knew about that. But uh, a couple of the interesting things I thought in this article were um, the way that uh, having a greater deal, a greater amount of women in security actually uh, makes, makes your security team more robust. Um, oh, yeah. And this actually has some this actually has some some interesting points in that regard. In that, uh, one of them I thought was interesting is that forty four percent of women uh, in infosec fields have degrees in business and social sciences, um, which is a, a higher proportion than men, and that can be very helpful in terms of um, a variety of areas, not just uh, not least of which is uh, being able to you know, uh, empathize with an adversarial mindset and being able to uh, uh, make better connections between business needs and security measures and um, being able better position to uh, educate the teams. Now that was another, uh, that was another area that I thought um, was interesting here in that uh, mm, cyber mentioned girl. that that yeah, female, female uh, infosec professionals put a higher um, priority on uh, internal training and uh, education and security and risk management. Um, so I, thought I, that I was saw the Girl Scouts getting big in this, and also Teen Vogue. Yes, yeah, I know. I saw that a couple of years ago, and I was really surprised, but it made me really happy. Um, and then also a couple of the other points that they made that. Uh, uh, women are, are uh, very adept at selecting uh, partner organizations um, to help develop secure, more secure software and uh, tend to pay more attention to those partner organizations. Uh, you know, qualifications, their personnel, their ability to meet contractual obligations. Um, you know, are they performing their own independent security tests and so on and so forth. And I thought that that was... I thought that that was interesting in that I've, I've actually seen that happen in the wild too, where, um, you know, whatever the new hotness is, you, these, these decision makers just get sold on it because they get taken out to lunch or whatever. And um, I saw this, I saw a, a great example of this I saw was uh, um, a company that I was working at at one point when, I don't know if you all remember this, but a few years back, uh, Magento, which is like a shopping cart uh, framework, essentially, was like blown wide open as as like being just totally full of security holes. And and uh, a week later, like like they they essentially flew um, they flew down uh, several decision makers from this company to their uh, headquarters in like Atlanta or something like that, and you know, wind them and dine them for a few days and they come back and they're like, oh, we're going to use this. And, and the lead engineer and I are like, uh, guys, that's probably not the, 
that's probably not the best move right now. Like, have you have you seen the news for the past two weeks? And uh, they're like, oh, we don't we don't care about any of that. We like them, so we're just gonna go with them. So yep. you know, maybe sometimes it's good to actually vet your <laughs> third party dependencies. Oh yeah. And I, one thing, like I say, as I move, as I get older in this business, I get less and less excited by the newest technical hack and more and more interested in the boring management stuff, like the blue team and the attack framework. And I, that's why, you know, I, I think the, the hardcore technical young men say, oh, women don't do the technical stuff because they're just dumb. And I think it's probably more the opposite. They're focusing on what the real risk is more than the men who are dazzled by the technical doodads of today's fun attack. And this is how you get the cliche in cybersecurity. Some new cybersecurity hire says, I found this problem. Management has to stop everything and spend a bunch of money fixing my one problem. And they're like, oh, that's not really an important problem. What matters more is, you know, like uh, upgrading the fire system or something. He's like, what are you talking about? You have to fix my little technical thing. It's super important, which it probably isn't. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yep. I thought that was an interesting take. It is, yeah. That's why I always try to encourage more women. And the one thing that uh, Olivia told me, I said, you know, I keep saying I want more women, but they don't show up. And then when I, you became a teacher, all these women appear. And she said, yeah, you can talk about it. That doesn't do any good. They have to see a real role model who looks like them. That's what does it. That is absolutely really what does it. Anyway. So, uh, Instabot. Sonic Wall made this great uh show uh this new new ransomware instabot and how it functions so you get you see uh how the malware makes dns requests and, and the conversations that happens between the the system it you uses this icon how is this icon going to convince you it's safe like apparently what it does though <laughs> who knows Trojan <laughs> yep yep that's not malicious at all this is a great request, PHP. Yeah. Oh, look at there, and then comes a public key, neat. Yep, yep. Okay, to download additional malware. Of course. And then it has oh, a- Oh, here's a, a shell, uh, Windows executable, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's called update1.exe, because you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. This, is, <laughs> this, this right? sounds like a pretty amateurish act. Is this thing works? Apparently it does. Your files can't be opened. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, gee, you know, I wrote some ransomware. I never quite finished. I was going to use it for, like, projects and stuff. And there's some open source ransomware that is really this simple. Well, anyway, okay. <laughs> and, Sometimes uh, the simple stuff works. Yeah. yeah. Then we got XPS. <laughs> oh, uh, we were talking about this before the, the stream started. Yeah. And um, yeah, Microsoft for a while has been trying to make their own PDF. And apparently they've been succeeding more than we ever knew because there's a, a wonderful RCE bug in the format where any .NET um, executable, if it tries to read the XPS file. So for those who don't know, XPS is sort of Microsoft's version of a PDF file. So you can print to a XPS file. It never took off, um, but in uh, this article, it goes over the how to inject code into the XPS file, and any program that uses the standard libraries for reading the file would then execute the code. And I have no idea how this made it into production, but all you can do, all you do, so the, the XPS file is using a standard uh, XML uh, format, mm -hmm. and you have this XML, these XML tags here starting with, um, uh, X type diag process right there and, and you know method name whatever and um, you just throw in your shell code in there and it runs. <laughs> Sounds great, yeah. yeah. This is it's so nice that uh, the Microsoft created all these orphan standards that are just built into their software and then forgotten. That's totally how you get hosed. Yeah, it reminds me of the one a few years ago where all the online cloud providers were hosed because the cloud-based virtual machines have virtual floppy drives that nobody remembered existed. And of course, that code hadn't been patched in 10 years and it had trivial exploits and stuff. I said, <laughs> why is there a virtual floppy on my cloud server? Well, that's the default. <laughs> nobody noticed. <laughs> yeah, that's how you get it. That's yes, why you right. I remember no that. I remember that virtual floppy. 
Oh yeah. It, it makes total sense that it's like the part of your code that nobody remembers existed. That was up like, like I remember when I went to a, a, one of the first B sides, I think, and HD Moore was there and he said, I found something really awesome and you have to turn off the recording because I found a bug in NTP. And I'm like, NTP, what the hell? <laughs> of course, NTP network time protocol was like 20 years old. Nobody had looked at the code and he found like awesome exploits using it because nobody thought about it in years anyway. So that's good stuff. And so this one, uh, I don't think this is all that new either, but um, the, uh, anyway, this, I just saw this goodbye. So this reopen America stuff is a Russian or Chinese attack on America and they're mostly bots doing it. Or of course they cannot prove where they come from, but typically this is uh, Russian influences. And so it's interesting to watch. Um, and this is what um, Bin Laden said in his articles, Osama Bin Laden. He said, America is very weak and they're very easy to manipulate. And all you have to do is poke them and they will destroy themselves spending billions of dollars running around, securing all the airplanes and stuff. So they understand how to punch us where we're weak. Our weaknesses are very easy to spot. There's an incredible number of useful idiots who you can inspire to do something stupid with just like a little bit of racism on Twitter or something. And uh, essentially the whole Trump administration is the same thing, a gigantic troll army uh, tricking humans into doing something against their own best interests. And he's trying to do it again with this um, latest uh, Obamagate thing. It is interesting, but it gives us nothing new. Churchill said the same thing when he tried in vain to get America to enter World War II. He said, you have to understand America. You can't get them to do anything just because it's the right thing to do. They have to waste their time doing stupid things, ramming their head against the wall for years before they finally figure out that they need to do the obvious thing that we can see clearly. It's like, um, he said, America will always do the right thing after they have tried everything else. So I, this is why, you know, my, my left wing friends are always frustrated with me because I say, yes, you're right about the Trump administration, but you're wrong to freak out so much. This is nothing new. This is standard America. <laughs> Your belief that it was ever any better is the mistake. Anyway, um, I'll do a lot more of that next, next semester in 160. Assuming they actually let students register and don't cancel all the classes, which is not that clear yet. But anyway. Um, yeah, it seems like they're trying to prevent them from registering at this well, they point. Don't, they aren't talking about canceling my classes yet, but I noticed there's still nobody in them. And the students trying to register say they're having trouble. Presumably yeah. they'll fix that in some way. God only knows. <laughs> Our college seems to be more messed up than usual, if such you know, a thing is possible. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm definitely leaning towards never in, uh, attribute to malice what can be explained by incompetence, but uh, this one makes you wonder. Oh, I don't see any evidence of malice. I never have at the college because the evidence is so abundant of incompetence. But I, what do I know? There have been some people saying it's a right-wing conspiracy to get rid of public education. I think it's just uh, underfunding. See how they think that, considering uh, the current state of affairs. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they do think so. Anyway, so um, this is a pretty cute one, too. Actually, not that different than that uh, Microsoft invitation PDF thing. You know, I just want to say one of the newsworthiest things about this art piece of news is that yeah. This is the second article in two weeks that we found off of Forbes that wasn't garbage. I know. Uh, so I found it. I've been avoiding Forbes for like six Me months because, because I listened to like Steve Gibson and he got totally hosed twice by believing articles on Forbes. And it, it came out that Forbes doesn't edit anything. They just give you like yes. a permission to post stuff. So it's just random bloggers. But so now what I do is I go to Forbes and I look to see who wrote it. Yep. And if only if I trust that person, do I pay any attention to it? And I don't know this guy, but... Like it is just basically a random blog, but it could be all right. Well, this one's good because it actually links to the uh, research study, uh, yeah. the research paper. Uh, but uh, I thought this was really interesting. And one of the reasons that I uh, actually included this cause, was because it's got a great line in it um, that, uh, the, <laughs> that basically uh, compares the technology that uh, this attack is leveraging to COBOL because it never completely went away, even though no one ever thinks about it because yeah, it's so yeah. old and obsolete. So um, uh, you, you guys might remember um, that here, this hasn't been a thing in a while, but um, you might remember back when 
uh, premium text messaging was really a thing. Uh, you know, you could get your get your daily horoscope or whatever uh, for 99 cents uh, each time and people would do it. They'd sign up for these services or, you know, text, uh, text this five digit number to vote for your favorite like pop star or pop song or whatever. And uh, people would do it. And, and um, essentially that, those services leveraged a, uh, leveraged um, WAP or a web application protocol, um, uh, yeah. which still exists, but it's, but it's obsolete and kind of, you know, um, falling mm. out of use, but uh, not, that's more of the case here and not necessarily at, for a lot of um, carriers overseas. And so uh, attackers have been exploiting this and using it to um, get a bunch of money from people. Yep. Um, which I think is pretty interesting. So uh, the study, I thought the study was really good. One thing I really liked about the study is that um, it publishes all of the source code and there are some hilarious comments in the source code itself from the attackers saying what it's doing. The way they do, the way they accomplish this is through harvesting um, MSISDN, which are um, you know, identifying numbers on each uh, phone that are used for the uh, billing, the, and it's it's silent billing. You don't you don't uh, it just gets added onto your phone bill. You don't agree to use a credit card or anything like that. So you could have a ten thousand dollar phone bill and not even realize it or understand it. But one of the comments in the in the code is like, okay, this section harvests the ISDN and sends it to us. <laughs> you know, it's yep. pretty funny. Yeah, that sounds great. I know this This has been going on forever. I, I did a lawsuit years ago where they did this in the days of dial-up modems. They would put malware in your machine, make it dial up through Moldova, and then charge you like $10 a minute for your internet connection. And then you get a bill for like 2000 bucks. Wow, that's crazy. And, uh, the, um, and this is essentially like in-app purchases or a similar thing. I, I have another friend who told me he finally had to cut his wife off from paying to skip levels on Candy Crush because it was like a $500 a month. He said, no more. Yes, that's happened with uh, kids too. Some kid I ran think. like a $10,000 worth of in-app purchases on their parents' account. I remember reading about that when the first um, smart refrigerators came out with like an iPad on the fridge so you could order more candy bars or chocolate milk or something and the kids could just do it. Yeah, well, it makes total sense. The best one, though, is the parrot ordering food off Alexa. Oh, I didn't. That's a great idea. Yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's an I will send you folks the video. It's, it's bloody awesome. The, the, oh, the, yeah. uh, the, the person's shopping list is full of like, like strawberries and birdseed and stuff. And they're like, what the hell? And then they realize it was the parrot adding it all to the list off Alexa. Yeah, is that that sounds fake. Is that real? No, it's real. I'm not <laughs> even making it up. It sounds great. <laughs> All right. And these guys impersonated Facebook, which is kind of funny as if Facebook is not malicious enough in the first place. Anyway. Right. Yeah, they impersonated uh, Facebook. They're denying it. It's a whole back and forth shenanigans between, yeah, you, you, fake, you fake Facebook, trigger people to get over there. Uh, but no, we're tackling terrorism, and it's all this back and forth drama. Well, sides. this is, and I know NSO has been really big on this. They they yeah. sell malware to governments, and then they claim to not be responsible for anything that happens. Right, and that's right. Actually, somebody else executed it. Well, and that's actually a very interesting issue. I mean, it's like you, um, I'm, it's like a, a lot of people sell something like guns, which are then used for bad purposes. And is that really your fault or not? It's a it's a very difficult issue. Right. So that's, that's kind of the issue here. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've certainly faced it myself. I got a, a gig uh, kind of on hold, but I have had a gig in Saudi Arabia and, you know, some people say you shouldn't be helping that nation at all. And I said, well, I don't know. The students, they want to learn some stuff. Why don't I teach it? It's, it's a tough one. And all American companies expanding into China 
should we like obey Chinese law? Well, what do you expect them to do? How can they go to China and not obey Chinese law? Right. It's, it's a, a permanently tough one. Anyway, and then a new battery. Well, I've been hearing about so many new batteries, they never seem to make it. Well, this Here. one, you're not going to see in your home um, unless it's connected to your solar uh, array. So the reason I wanted to, to make this uh, a new story to go over is that anytime there's a new electrical component, it changes the entire like electrical landscape. Like, for example, like um, when blue LEDs came out, um, that completely changed everything. Uh, that's why we have like LED lighting everywhere. Um, uh, it, it created entire new industries. Um, the same thing with supercapacitors a few year, years later. Uh, this is a, a new zinc type battery and it's supposedly cheaper than lithium ion. Uh, that doesn't mean it's more, it's more energy dense, but it means that you can store more energy in it uh, for less cost per, per kilowatt hour. Uh, and so what this will end up being used for, I imagine, is in, is in industry. So if you are uh, like a solar generating plant, instead of spending a lot of money on lithium batteries, which are expensive to build, it requires a lot of mining and um, resources that are, are difficult to get at. Uh, these will use zinc. So these are zinc type batteries. Mm -hmm. um, and they're totally rechargeable. Um, <laughs> and they'll supposedly in, in maybe a decade or two start popping up, like I said, in, um, in industrial applications. But what, 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 why don't we have them in laptops and everything? Do they not come in miniature sizes or something? As far as I can tell, uh, I mean, they're not, they don't go into specifics about this uh, technology in the article, but as far as I can tell, they're, they're much larger. They're, they're kind of like, think about them like kind of like car batteries where they're huge and, you know, they take up a lot of space, but they're cheap. It sounds yeah. like I think Tesla would take. Yeah, maybe you might use them in Tesla, but once again, they're kind of heavy. Um, and they're not, and I doubt they're as dense as lithium batteries, but yeah. they're non-toxic and they're, they're cheaper. So if you have, if space is not an issue, I yeah. think these are going to be the batteries to use. So they'll be in power plants or something. Exactly. It's, it's too bad because I think there are a lot of reasons that lithium is not good. I think actually a lot of harm is done mining it and mm -hmm. it, it tends to overheat and blow up and create a waste disposal problem and stuff. So it'd be nice if a, another technology would be available. That's yeah, I don't think, yeah, I don't think this is going to replace lithium as far as your cell phones go. Yeah. But you could totally replace them in, in places like if, we're, if you set up a, um, your solar panels on your roof, you're going to be using something like a lithium iron phosphate type batteries or some, some other type of lithium batteries to store the power. Yeah. Um, this could replace that. Yeah. Um, so I just have big boxes of, of zinc batteries, which would be cheaper, safer. It's, it's the, the, the battery type itself is called zinc air. So it's, I guess, using air as an electrolyte, I guess. I don't know. I, I'm like, not a materials expert. <laughs> I like, I like the, uh, the power systems that use mechanical storage. They just have a rock and they lift the rock. Oh, and right. right. Oh, the that, rock comes down. That, that seems great to me, but you know, anyway. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's a way to do things. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so, so yeah, the, the other thing about this battery is, is supposedly it's less likely to blow up. And I'm not sure if that's because it's made of zinc, so you can't break it as easily, or if it's because it just can't handle the, the current like a lithium ion can. I don't know. Well, it looks like it uses a whole different technology. I mean, lithium ion yeah. batteries actually mix the lithium in the electrolyte. So at a certain density, it forms short circuits and blows up. This right. looks like a whole different concept. Yep. Yeah, okay. Any more comments from folks? No. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.